Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your moderator, John O'Sullivan. Monica Jablonska. Paul Kangor. Peter Robinson. And Craig Shirley. I'm going to join my colleagues in a moment in the chair, but just very briefly to welcome them uh, and to say we're very fortunate to have an extremely talented group of uh, Reagan and um, John Paul observers and historians here. Um, you know the you know more about them already from the program, um, but I'm just going to briefly introduce Monica Jablonska as the author of a book on John Paul in a way the saint. Uh, um, Paul Kengel, who has written several books on the alliance, the partnership between John Paul and Ronald Reagan. Um, uh, Peter Robinson, um, who has, uh, was, a, like me, uh, a speechwriter in his case for Ronald Reagan, in my case for Margaret Thatcher, and finally Craig Shirley, who is a veteran conservative, the author of a number of books on Reagan, and all members of this panel can look at these two men um, from a, not a deep understanding and personal knowledge. Now, I'm going to begin by asking Monica if she would talk to us about an aspect of these two men that is not normally touched on, and that is the fact that they were both actors. That's known about um, Ronald Reagan, of course. It was his other great career. But we don't think of the Pope, in a way, uh, John Paul II, as an actor, and yet, Monica. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning. Uh, yes, absolutely, John Paul II and President Ronald Reagan, they were both men of the theater. One became the spiritual leader of the Catholic Church, and the other one of uh, leader of the free world and American politics. We all know that theater has the potential to transcend the art of the word and gesture and uh, become the art of the pure word. And both those men recognize this instinctively in their own way. Uh, by using the power of the spoken word, they confront evil. And the evil was, for them, easy to recognize. It had his face and a name. It was the totalitarian uh, communist system. So, in their own way, by speaking simply and clearly, they express themselves and they express something that they truly stood for. So they both believed in the power of the spoken word, the word that shape lives and change destinies, change people's minds and hearts as well. And I believe, I truly believe that the fact that they both were a man of the theater really helped them, not only in terms of the communication skills, but also to understand the power of the word, the meaning of the word. And what's the most important, I would say, to touch the very sensitive and deep subject of human being, human dignity, human values, and its possibilities. So it was amazing, absolutely amazing aspect, both of those amazing people. And as I remember well, the President Ronald Reagan and John Paul II they didn't speak much about their experience in theater, but I, I think that they didn't have to because, because they perfectly understood each other and uh, each recognized in the other um, a shared sense of drama of late 20th century's life and the drama of communism. So I truly believe that it was very important for them and this power of the pure word, the power of the drama, and uh, I believe that it really helped them to defeat the communism and bring freedom, not only to Poland, but to the, to the world. Can I ask you about a particular moment, um, a, a very theatrical moment as it turned out, and that is the arrival of John Paul for his first visit as Pope to Poland. Um, when, it, when it seems, at the, when you look at the film of that, 
he comes onto the stage, he's got a government, a hostile government meeting him. He's got a large crowd waiting to hear him. And it seems to me that he takes command of that moment. Uh, and for the rest of, the, of, of the, his trip to Poland, which was a historic event, here you have somebody who, by means of his own personality, projected like a good actor on the stage, turns the whole event into a triumph political triumph in which he never says a word about politics. All his remarks are sermons addressed to Christian virtue. Was that something you remember as having a big impact? Well, I was uh, one year old, <laughs> so I was very little. But I can only say that uh, for sure his experience in theater helped him to carry out his mission. His, um, he had a magnificent voice and gesture, sense of gesture, sense of beauty, um, and uh, pause, uh, uh, very characteristic for the homilies. And absolutely yes, because for me, being a priest is also being an actor. <laughs> Um, perhaps I could uh, then talk to uh, Paul about the first time these two actors met, uh, because they came from very, very different backgrounds. Yeah, that, well, that's right, John. So they, the first time they met was June 1982 at the Vatican. But Ronald Reagan had wanted to meet John Paul II, I mean, right away. And, and Lee Edwards mentioned earlier the trip to Poland in June 1979, just referenced. And... Ronald Reagan was, was watching it on the news. He was watching news clips. He was with Dick Allen, Richard V. Allen, in, in California at the time. And I've talked to him about this a number of times, including just a couple weeks ago. It just, you, I want to hear the story again, right? And they were, they were talking foreign policy. Allen would be Reagan's first national security advisor through all of 1981, and Bill Clark would follow him. And they were talking foreign policy in 1979. They decided to take a break and turn on the evening news to see what was going on. In those days, there were two or three channels on TV, kids, right? I mean, it wasn't uh, CNN or Fox or MSNBC. So they turned on CBS or NBC, and Reagan saw these massive crowds of people greeting, greeting this Polish pontiff. And he was, he was indeed so moved that Dick Allen looked over, and there were tears in, in Reagan's eyes, and he said, Dick, that's it. The Pope is the key. The Pope is the key. The Pope is the key. We need to get elected. It's not an easy thing to do, right? And we need to reach out to this new Pope in the Vatican and make them an ally. And, and Reagan, who had already said at that point, as Lee mentioned earlier, or as you mentioned earlier, Peter, we win, they lose. Okay, but how are you going to do that? Right. So with the election, all of a sudden, the first non-Italian pope in 455 years, the first Slavic pope ever, and right from the middle of the Soviet bloc, you know, from, from Poland, this was a complete game changer. So, so now he had that, that tool to really try to enact change. So he wanted to meet with him from the very beginning. It got derailed by a number of things. One, Reagan had to win the election, which he did in November of 80. And then they started communicating, Dick Allen and others, in the Vatican right away, June and, and February 1981. And then Ronald Reagan was shot in March of 81. And then a few weeks after that, John Paul II was shot on and, and May 13th, 1981. They both could have bled to death. They required respectively six to eight pints of blood to be transfused. I mean, they were really, if there would have been a delay on the way to George Washington University Hospital over here from the Washington Hilton or to the hospital in Rome, they could have, they could have bled to death in the vehicles. So they finally got together. By the end of 1981, Martin and Annalise Anderson estimate that they exchanged a dozen or so letters between each other. Mm -hmm. So they were, you know, there was a talk last night about whether or not to call this a partnership or an alliance. Well, that's some pretty vigorous activity right there. They hadn't met yet, but at least a dozen letters by the end of 1981. So they finally met at the Vatican, June 1982. They met alone in the, in the Vatican Library for about 50 minutes. And they said to one another, they shared their mutual conviction that God had spared their lives for a special purpose, which they believed was to take on this evil empire, as Ronald Reagan would call it the next year. So there was this very significant shared sense of providential purpose, which you would expect, of course, from a pope, Right, but a lot of people at that time didn't think that way about Ronald Reagan, but Reagan likewise had this very strong sense of the, of the DP, the divine plan, 
as he and Bill Clark called it. They had an acronym for it, the DP. So that was the first time they met, June 1982. Could I just ask uh, two questions about that? Um, at the time, um, those meetings were very private, so to speak. And, um, has much more come out about what the two men discussed when, uh, when they were in private? Because I know, for example, Reagan obviously spoke to, to Frank Shakespeare, about them to Frank Shakespeare, right. who, of course, kept the confidence that he was given. But I wonder what we now know. And in particular, was that a meeting at which they dis each discovered that the other was determined to try to bring to an end to nuclear weapons uh, as the main basis of defense? The, the, the Vatican Library records of that event will be, tr will be released in the year, uh, in, in June 2057. Okay. So they are under 75 year seal and I couldn't get a hold of them and nobody can and they don't make any exceptions. The Reagan Library has some make material. Make a date, make a date. <laughs> make a date, yeah. Meet in Rome. <laughs> yeah, if, 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 if I make it, I'll be 90 at, at that, at that, at and that point. And John will just be warming up. <laughs> right, that will so we'll just be warming up. So, so those are still closed. There are some records at the Reagan Library, and most of what I learned was from people who were with Reagan, who, who talked to Reagan immediately on the spot, including Bill Clark. Mm -hmm. And Clark was at Reagan's side throughout all, all of this entire, in fact, I recently watched a video and when Reagan's coming out of the building, he's walking with Bill Clark and they're going to the limousine and right, you know, right there, he, he was telling him the things that were said. And there were also a number of, of things reported by the, by the Pope's aides to journalists. So that's the best that we have. Mm. You know, unfortunately, we don't have at this point, mm. or at least not access to anything along the lines of a direct transcript. Yeah. Good, thank you. Um, uh, Peter, you were, uh, he, uh, Rake was an actor, uh, you were a, a speechwriter. Um, he wrote, you wrote his scripts, uh, so to speak. So to speak. Um, let me ask you this, when he gave his great speech in Westminster, um, uh, predicting the near end of communism, he used a teleprompter which was completely new to the Brits and they assumed that the two Perspex screens were some kind of security device and going up to congratulate him, Mrs. Thatcher said, um, I congratulate you on your actor's memory, that was a brilliant performance <laughs> and, and Reagan said, don't you know about the teleprompter, it's a British invention. <laughs> Um, uh, what did Reagan do to your speeches, Peter? How did he change them? And of course, papal encyclicals are another matter, but we learned it's something interesting last night. Uh, Ronald Reagan was the best editor I've ever had. Uh, so, for example, I, I was not, uh, I, actually I had, wasn't in the White House yet when he gave that speech in June of 1980. Two, is that right? June of 82. I've, I, I joined up the operation a few months later. But if you go to the Reagan Library, the principal author of that speech was Tony Dolan. And if you go to the Reagan Library, you will discover two things. One, that President Reagan, him, in his own hand, you'll see him rewriting between a third and half of the speech. Item one. Item two, you can... <laughs> If you know the story beforehand, it helps. But even if you don't, you can work out that this speech got to Ronald Reagan over the objections of his staff. Judge Clark, national security advisor, walked into the Oval Office with Tony Dolan's draft, and the president set aside the drafts that had come up through David Gergen and the usual communications route. That's actually worth noting, I think. Westminster Address, June 1982. Evil Empire Address, his address to the National Association of Evangelicals in March of 1983. I'm looking at, I'm looking, I, I, I was there, but I'm looking at the historians for confirmation of the times and dates. Yes, you're right. <laughs> and then Berlin Address in June of 1987. All three of those speeches he delivered over the objections, semi-violent objections, of his senior staff, the National Security Council, and so forth. So that's to the point when, when, it said, when it gets said, I don't know about the Pope, but about Ronald Reagan, that he overrode the instructions and recommendations of his staff, he did so over and over and over again. And there is documentary evidence of that in the archives at the Reagan Library. Second point that may be of interest here, the 1982 Westminster Address is early in the administration. 
And as I say, he rewrote in his own hand between a third and half of that speech. Later on, by the time you get to 1987 and a speech that I had something to do with, the Berlin Address, much less rewriting. And so you can see the actor. You can see that he's not just an actor. He's the editor, and he's training his speechwriting staff. In part, he's working out exactly how he wants to say what he wants to say. But he's also training the speechwriters so that eh, we need more adjustment here earlier on. And as the administration goes on, we understand him, he understands us, but it's clear. Uh, again, uh, this is tricky because we speechwriters did write the speeches. But the source of the speeches, as well as the ultimate end of the speeches, was Ronald Reagan. We don't know about the Pope, of course, though last night we heard from President Klaus that he thought that the person who was the main drafter of the Centismus Annus um, uh, encyclical was Michael Novak. And, um, and I'm, I'm absolutely certain Michael had enormous input into that. It's fair to say, I think, that encyclicals are, are like government white papers. They go through many hands. Mm. And what's interesting about the Pope here is that on issues like liberation theology, as it affected American policy, uh, and nuclear weapons, he repeatedly refused to endorse drafts sent to him that were you know, very critical of American policy and sent them back. And, um, and that is something which has not been written a great deal about, I think. But let me now turn to someone who knows about that. But, and, and with a bias to the question, Craig, can I ask you to talk about that? But about Reagan the conservative on the one hand and the degree to which John Paul was conservative in his political opinions, or, or was he a mixture of anti-communist on the one hand and, so to speak, social, socially benevolent liberal on the other? What, how would you describe Well, I'd have to defer to Paul on um, John Paul's political views. There's no doubt about it. He, he was an anti-communist. He was violently anti-communist. He's the first pope in four or five hundred years who's not from you know, Italy. He's from the Eastern Bloc, and he saw what the Soviets had done to his beloved country. Just as Margaret Thatcher saw what the what uh, communist provocateurs had do, done to the labor and and uh, and uh, uh, left wing uh, party movements in uh, in England in the 60s, 70s, uh, just as Reagan saw what communists had done in Hollywood. So they all had a very refined view of what what communism was and what communism provocateurs could do to stable economic systems. I am reminded, and, um, is the, and I think it, it's important. I think symbolism is important. Early in the Reagan administration, uh, the administration decided to change the diplomatic tags from the Soviet embassy to begin with the initials FC. Now, nobody needed to guess what that stood for. <laughs> but it, it, it caps, it, I think it, it crystallized, is, is that unlike Truman, Unlike Eisenhower, unlike Johnson, Kennedy is, is that this was a radical change in policy. We were not going to, it was not going to be containment, it was not going to co be coexistence, it was not going to be detente. Is, is that Reagan had made clear from early, in his very first press conference, which, you, you remember, he said they reserve under their right to lie, cheat, and steal. And he was, this was, this was the, the foreign policy establishment just came down with the withers. Oh my God, we have an American president saying the honest things about the Soviet? How can, how, how can he do that? Uh, so it is, I'm, I'm also reminded too, is it that John, you asked previously about Reagan being an actor, and of course he was, we all know that. But I think that it's instructive, you know, toward the end of his presidency, he was doing an interview with, in the Oval Office with uh, Tom Brokaw. I think it was with Tom Brokaw on NBC. And Brokaw asked Reagan a very interesting question, one he'd never been asked before. And he said, is that, Mr. President, did you learn anything from your time in Hollywood to become president or to become what many think is a good president? And Reagan replied, he says, I don't know how you can do this job and not be an actor. 
Well, I, yes, you laugh, but I thought there was great wisdom in that because he understood what Shakespeare said. The play's the thing, is that all great leaders are great actors. George Washington never went before the Continental Congress without his general's uniform and his epaulets brushed and his, and his buttons polished and his saddle you know, uh, polished to a sheen. Uh, you know, Robert E. Lee pulls out his finest uniform to go to surrender at Appomattox to, to, uh, to uh, uh, Grant is that all great leaders understand the play is the thing and that presentation is important. You cannot get people's attention without putting on a good show. You cannot, you simply can't do that. Um, so I, I, I think that Reagan, and obviously he was intellectual. Marty Anderson estimated that Reagan's IQ may have been as high as 175. And if anybody would know, it would be Marty, our old dear friend, who was there with Reagan for so many years. Uh, is that but is his anti-communism started in the 1940s, you know, as we've seen from his letters, his pronouncements, through, G, through his years at the GE Theater, where he fought for uh, scripts, uh, because there were script writers who were, who were atheists and who refused to, you know, one didn't write, write scripts. I remember one, in fact, it was mentioned in Paul's book, A Pope and a President, which is terrific, uh, about the atheist uh, screenwriters didn't want to portray a little girl praying. And Reagan fought to have that portrayed in this uh, GE Theater episode. Um, so I think that Reagan understood that being an actor was important, but, but he understood that when you have the stage, you have to do something with it. Um, we all know that Reagan was a great American, and um, this is an important element in his appeal. I mean, he was the ideal American. Um, but when we turn to look at um, uh, John Paul II, he was, of course, first and for first a Pole. And he came from um, a church which was the most effective in resisting um, communist and the communist government in, in Eastern Europe, far more effective than any of the other uh, Eastern and Central European countries. Before um, John Paul, of course, there was Cardinal Wyszynski, who was a very tough an able leader. But after John Paul, it seems um, to uh, observers that John Paul overrode the clerical bureaucrats who believed in Ostpolitik in, in the um, uh, Vatican, but also he overrode the caution of the bishops in Poland in their attitude to solidarity. Is that a, an accurate picture? And, does it, and where does, in a sense, the Pope as Pole emerge here? Is, it's, he's a specific sort of Pope because he's a Pole, isn't he? Uh, well, definitely, um, being a Polish, actually, to understand the Polish Pope, you have to understand Polishness, yeah. Polish history, Polish culture, Polish literature. And I think that um, John Paul II, Karol Wojtyła, brought the best of the best from Poland. So it was not an accident that he became a Pope. It was a special purpose. And then it was a special purpose for uh, President Ronald Reagan. So they, as I said uh, at the very first beginning, they both uh, needed each other. Probably they couldn't achieve their goal uh, on their own. By, um, so they needed, President Reagan needed John Paul II and John Paul II needed President Ronald Reagan to get a victory, to succeed, uh, not only um, on this political stage, but also as a Catholic, John Paul II. And Ronald Reagan also knew that um, Poland is very strong, and, this is, and we have the um, Polish strong Catholic Church. And I can say that we may use this, but it might help a lot to, def to defeat the communism. So the power of the Catholic Church and John Paul II and Polish bishops and Polish people brought them hope and courage, actually, to fight against the communism and help to bring the freedom to Poland. So those two people are not longer with us, but we need their wisdom and moral clarity. Yes, isn't it the case, in fact, that uh, the... the um 
both men were very unusual in, among the men and statesmen and w women of their age in seeing that communism was actually fragile. Mm. And, and that, was, that separated them from, out from the entire establishment of political, foreign policy and also clerical. Absolutely. And it was not only a form of government, as President Rogan, Ronald Reagan said, but it was a real evil. Yeah. And they needed to uh, make a plan to understand each other. So that's what uh, they met in life. And it was a perfect meeting of the minds. Yes, yes. Thank you. Could I, um, I know Paul wants to come in. So why don't you answer this point? And I've got sure. another one for you. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, Reagan referred to Poland as the martyred nation of Poland. He had, he had a special love for Poland, which seems odd, right? I mean, he didn't, he wasn't Polish. He did, uh, he, uh, I think he was, uh, what, uh, Irish, I think a little bit, right? And, and, and exactly. And he was, uh, but he, his sympathy for Poland and, uh, Bill Clark used to say this all the time, went back to Yalta. He believed that, that the Poland had been sold down the river at Yalta, along with a, a number of other nations in, in Eastern Europe. So he, probably more than almost any other country, uh, the, the references that he made to Poland, uh, you go to the, the public presidential papers, they're, they're all through there. Uh, by the way, the, the, the two largest biographies of Reagan, not yours, yours probably would, would uh, yours are great, but I won't say who the authors are. There's like literally a half dozen references to Poland yes. in, the, in the two books combined. Yeah, don't forget is that uh, when he was at Liberty State Park launching his fall campaign in 1980, on the dais was Lechowitz's father. Oh, wow. is that so? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And uh, also, too, the Westminster speech was given the day after he left the Vatican, mm -hmm. after meeting with John Paul II. So the fact that he would leave that meeting with John Paul II and then go to Westminster and talk about communism ending up on the ash heap of history, it's pretty remarkable. Mm -hmm. And he, On Poland, he talked about Poland so much that one Soviet publication mocked him and said it's only a matter of time before the American president starts speaking Polish. <laughs> uh, but but and 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 also too, I got to add the Catholic element here. Reagan, of course, was not Catholic, but he was surrounded by Catholics, and probably I I mean couldn't have been more pro-Catholic. His uh, his you had Bill Clark, you had Dick Allen, Al Haig. Al Haig's brother was a priest. Uh, a number of speech writers, Tony Dolan, yourself, Peggy Noonan. The uh, Jane Wyman, his his ex-wife, had converted to Catholicism. She was a Fulton Sheen convert. Jane Wyman died a third order Dominican nun, buried in the habit. That's how devout Jane Wyman became. His father was was Catholic. Some people think that he wasn't very devout. That's hard to say. His brother Neil, his only sibling, was a daily communicant by the by the end of his life. So he was he was surrounded by Catholics and, and knew Catholicism. Bill Clark used to say that Ronald Reagan understood Catholicism better than most Catholics he knew, mm. which uh, might have been true. I, I, I think. I think he was a cultural Catholic. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. And you know, when they were children, when yeah. when Neil and, and Reagan were children. Moon, they were never called by their parents, Neil and, uh, and Ron, but uh, Moon and Dutch. And, parent, and they always called their parents by their first names. Never called them mom and dad, even the small children. But the parents gave Neil and Dutch a choice when they were, when they were children. Go, she was D of C, he was Catholic. You could follow me into the Roman Catholic Church or follow your mother and the disciples of Christ. Neil chose to go into the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, Reagan chose to go in the DFC following his mother. But even so, I think Jack Reagan's Catholicism is an under-researched topic. I think that he brought home a parish perspective and that that informed Reagan. That it, I hate that word, informed, but that inculcated Reagan with that parish perspective. And it showed up is, is that, you know, he didn't talk like a Protestant. He talked like a Catholic. You know, he, it's eerily reminiscent of John Kennedy. He didn't say, my government, he didn't choose the Protestant, I, me, and my, but the Catholic, we, us, and ours. So when he talked about the government, he said, your government, this government, he didn't say, like Trump says, my government, my administration, my White House, my Pentagon, my military chiefs, my everything. Uh, he, said, he said, this government, like, like John Kennedy, or your government, John, like John Kennedy. I think it was very much a cultural Catholic. Mm 
I think we should also remember that when Reagan died, in his message to uh, Mrs. Reagan, the Pope referred to Ronald Reagan's noble soul. I mean, that's a very powerful and moving uh, message with a lot of implications of an ecumenical kind. <laughs> uh, but let me go back, Paul, if I could, and ask you about the fact that, that on the one hand, Reagan's, one of Reagan's biggest problems in office was the Sandinista regime. On the other hand, one of the biggest problems that uh, the Pope faced and his um, successor uh, was liberation theology. Um, to what extent did they form a partnership on that question? Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. While, while John Paul II and Ronald Reagan are trying to support the Solidarity Movement in Poland to undermine communism in, in Eastern Europe, you have... Um, Jesuits and people in Central America and in Nicaragua and liberation theology who were supportive of the Sandinista regime. And I, and I don't want to say the Jesuits in mass, but I, you know, certain people within that order in particular, right? I don't know if I need to go through <laughs> all of that. But, but that, and for Jean Paul II, and, and well, wait, I'm, I'm pursuing this strategy in Eastern Europe of liberating Eastern Europe through the support of the Catholic Church in Poland and Solidarity Movement. And here, all of this is going on in Central America, which was in our backyard, as Bill Clark and Ronald Reagan and Dick Allen and others put it. So uh, yeah, it, was, it was very important for John Paul II to repudiate liberation theology, not just from mm -hmm. like a political or international geostrategic perspective, but he felt it was against the very tenets of Roman Catholicism. I think it was at um, Pope Pius the 11th who said one cannot be a, a socialist and a true Catholic and and the church had been condemning communism and socialism and encyclicals back to literally 1846 you know two years before the communist manifesto was published so so he he thought it was really critical to to reject that mm. and and perhaps I could turn to Peter and ask him a question um, the same kind about uh, which came up last night and that is the, the fact that the Pope uh, in Centesimus Annus, writes an encyclical that comes closer than any other encyclical I can recall to um, uh, accepting or looking with some favor at least on liberal economics and capitalism. Um, and this is done at a time, or indeed just after, Ronald Reagan has not simply revived capitalism in America and worldwide, but to a great degree transformed it. It was a different kind of capitalism. We call it information capitalism. We could give it other names. To what extent was there, a, do you see links between these two things or mere coincidence? Well, the link in the person of Michael Novak, of course, who was close to the Reagan administration and close to the Pope. This may tread, John, just stand up and slap me if I'm moving in a direction that you don't want me to move in. But you've already mentioned that the Pope overrode his bishops back in Poland on economics. You will recall, you will recall, because you and I wailed in outrage at the time, that the bishops in this country produced two, not encyclicals, but whatever the, yeah. thank goodness they didn't have binding authority on Catholics, but a letter on economics in which they assailed Reaganomics about 27 seconds before the longest peacetime expansion in American history began. The bishops got it all wrong. And they wrote a letter on nuclear weapons and so forth, which was clearly an attack on the Reagan administration about 28 seconds before the Reagan policy began working and cracking the Soviet regime. And uh, it's my understanding, other people, in fact, I think literally every other person on this panel knows more about this than I do, but it's my understanding that as those documents went back and forth to Rome, the American bishops, the bishops' conference, wanted stronger statements, and they kept coming back from Rome saying, well, re-examine this, re-examine that. Of course, Rome permitted the bishops conference in this country to go forward and get it wrong on both counts, but the documents were muted. The Vatican, let's just put it this way, the Pope didn't come roaring in and support those documents. You got the feeling there was distance between the pontiff and the American bishops conference. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I'm saying this, there are men of the cloth in the audience, and I made, but I, essentially that's correct, isn't it, right? Yes. In outline? Yes. Yes, I okay. So. Yeah. Especially on the, on the nuclear letter, and it was um, a fellow by the name of uh, Joseph Ratzinger, 
even that got involved on that one. That and, name rings yeah, a bell. And wanted uh, one of the American bishops to consider, and Clark in particular pushed this point. Judge as, Clark. Judge Clark, yep. as did Claire Booth Luce at the time, that uh, wanted to know, it, Ratzinger pushed the American bishops to consider if deterrence, because Clark said, you really need to understand, we're building up in order to build down. Right. We're building up this nuclear arsenal in order to get the Soviets to come to the table so that they will then remove their weapons. The idea isn't to build these up to use them. And so Ratzinger wanted the bishops to consider if that sort of deterrence was, was moral. Are they, are they completely ignoring this in the whole equation? And John Paul II himself got involved, and they did revise the statement. And, and uh, Colonel uh, uh, Bernardin, right, of Chicago, yes. Bernardine of Chicago, uh, they, they did revise it, and they came up with a letter that was much more in line with, uh, accurate with what the Reagan administration was intending. Let me address the economic side of that equation. You know, during the 80 campaign, uh, it's been overlooked, but he talked about what was his uh, grand strategy. There were three elements to it. That the United States was morally right and the Soviet Union was morally wrong. That you needed sufficient weapons to defeat or bargain with the Soviets. And to produce the weapons, you needed a strong economic system. But Reagan uh, was an early advocate of uh, Jack Kemp's what was then called the Jobs Creation Act, first introduced in September of 1976. Reagan did two or three radio commentaries about it very uh, quickly. But, it, it, you know, for Trump cut taxes, but I, I think that this is a thought that probably eludes him, but it, uh, Reagan understood it intensely, is that power can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only be moved around. And in early 81, he was meeting with a group of conservatives, and he was pitching the tax cut plan, um, Kemp, which was um, Graham Rudman, eventually became Brad, Graham Rudman. And he said, he said, yeah, it's about jobs, and it's about this and that and the other thing. He said, but really, it's about reordering man's relationship to the state. Now, A, that's a very profound thought. B, who in American politics talks like that anymore? But he understood is, is that Washington had, had, had accumulated too much power, in his opinion. And the power had been taken away from the people, which is where the framers and founders intended to be. And it was his intention to drain power away from Washington and send it back to the people where he thought it should belong. Uh, and, so, and so that was the real purpose. It was the, the philosophical commitment to the tax cuts, which was to return power to the states and ultimately the individual. Uh, and, and take it away from Washington. John, may, may I add yeah. just a tiny point? President Reagan never, never spoke on behalf of capitalism. Yeah. He spoke on behalf of freedom, yes. including economic freedom. Yes. And unless I'm mistaken, that was the formulation in Centesimus Annus as well, mm. that the Pope quite explicitly was speaking, he did, not, he did not support any particular political economic system but human liberty as it applied to economics. And that strikes me as there you see them both using the same formulation. I think he talked about three um, independent but mutually supportive sectors of society. Um, the government, um, the economy, um, and or the private sector, so to speak, in all its uh, variety. And then thirdly, um, the, um, the cultural sector, the legal and cultural environment and organizations, all of which, each of which influence the other. But, but it's a long time since I read Santissima Sanus. But I wanted to um, raise an, an, a different question. Um, the, uh, w w Craig, and that is um, um, Reagan, um, we're, we're talking at the moment a lot in this city and in America about nationalism and patriotism, good, bad, virtue, or danger. Um, and yet both Reagan and the Pope in different ways um, expressed views about nationhood and nationality. Right. And, I, and to what extent are those views the same views? To where, where do they differ in your view? Well, <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, I noticed yesterday Trump in his uh, speech at the UN used the word sovereign on a number of occasions, and I was happy to hear that. Uh, because Reagan used to talk about 
the, the sovereign uh, country and the sovereign states. Uh, you know, he used to talk about, uh, you know, these 50 states. He recognized the individual nature of all the states, the individual identity, the individual government, the individual, you know, economic systems of, 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 uh, of each state. Um, it, I'm trying to get, come up with an answer because it's a difficult question. Is that Reagan was no isolationist. Uh, that's clear. Uh, he, but he wasn't an internationalist either. I mean, you know, when he, nationalism to me connotes something far different than patriotism. Uh, nationalism borders on something like, you know, something anti-intellectual, like my country right or wrong. Where is is that Reagan would recognize that the country had been wrong mm -hmm. on a number of occasions, and he and he said so his time. He said, you know, that they were wrong. You know, made mistakes in Vietnam, but mostly his failure will. Uh, not the failure of the men in the uh, in the uh, in the fields in the in the battlefields uh, that you know we were wrong made other mistakes uh, over the years, but Reagan was no blind nationalist articulating what all, I would almost consider to be anti-intellectualism as far as the uh, country, but he believed that America was here for a divine reason. He, believe, he said this island of divine freedom, he said that on a number of occasions, he believed that the country was uh, godly inspired. And he believed that about the individual too, you know, is that Paul would know better than I, I, I probably Peter too, you know, you would know. I, I think that Reagan's two favorite philosophers, oddly enough, were Thomas Paine, and uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And he quoted them often, and you, you, you laugh, he says, well, how can that be? You know, here's Paine, the very flower of the Enlightenment, and here's Solzhenitsyn, who gives a speech at Harvard in 79, eviscerating the Enlightenment. But Reagan uses a very curious phrase in the 1980 campaign. He doesn't say, we all say, man and God. He says, man with God. And I think that that's very, very revealing where his mind is, is that is, you know, the age-old argument, who's at the center of the universe, God or man, and I think Reagan rejected that. He hated, you know, mutually assured destruction or submission. He found a third way with SDI. He liked other options, and I think that he thought that uh, if man was at the center of the universe, it was, a, it was as a spiritual being, because God wanted him there at the, at the center of the universe. It's, I think the problem here, one of the problems here is the word nationalism has got many different definitions, hasn't it? Yes. It can mean, as you said, anti-intellectual policy, and it can mean a hyper-intellectual concept in the hands of German philosophers, as indeed almost anything else can. So I think you wanted to... Um... Well, his, his two favorite Thomas Paine quotes were, these are the times that try men's souls, right. and we can begin the world all over, all over again. again right. So the way he was, he was applying that to the battle of his time, the international battle of his time. And it's interesting, speaking of nationalism and patriotism, the evil empire speech he doesn't get to the Soviet Union until about two-thirds into the speech. But the first part of it, he's condemning American slavery, racism, bigotry, anti-Semitism, uh, ethnic hatred. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a sustained attack on the sins of America first. And everybody forgets this, right? The, the press coverage at the time was... Um, in fact, it was, who was it, the New York Times? Anthony Lewis, I think, yeah. right? Who said that it was simplistic, one of the, uh, and Henry uh, Cominger as well at Columbia said it's the worst presidential speech ever written, and I've read Shallow, them all. Shallow, simplistic. Yeah, yeah. simplistic, and, um, and, and I think um, uh, Cohen at the Washington Post uh, also made the point that, uh, what do Ronald Reagan and my grandmother have in common? They're both bigots. He said after, which is a curious take I hope on the she whole. Thing. Slapped him. Right, <laughs> but 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 they didn't read the whole speech. I mean, he went through the speech and first laid out America for its sins, and then got to what he called borrowing from Whitaker Chambers and Witness the focus of evil in the modern world, which was the Soviet Union. And he said, you know, beware of the temptation to blithely put yourself above it all and say, we're both equally at fault. He said, we're not. One system is worse than the others. The other. That system, America has its sins, but what's going on in Moscow and the Kremlin right now in the 80s is evil. And to again, there's another religious statement. He said, as Christians, we are enjoined by Scripture and the Lord Jesus to oppose sin and evil with all of our might. And so for that reason, he's opposing it. John, an observation that I don't know what to do with, but you were Monica might. It's just occurring to me. The Pope being Pope, 
Any holder of that office, one would think, would feel tremendous temptation to say, tut, tut, these little nations don't really matter. What we're after here is global government. Well, uh, he runs an international institution, after all. But John Paul II dealt with nations as nations. We forget it, but it was so powerful. He lands in a country for the first time, he gets off the airplane, and he falls to his knees and kisses the ground. Mm. It, that's just a tremendous, he, he, to him, nationhood mattered. That was a, not only a useful unit, but in some ways a sacred unit, a sacred grouping of people. I have no idea what to do with that, but it, it's striking. It's also in line with traditional Catholic teaching, but Monica, you were nodding. <laughs> I just uh, wanted to add that a memory and identity actually says a lot about, na I wouldn't say nationalism because there are different definitions, but it says about a lot about Poland. Poland as a motherland, as a country, and the beauty of this place and about Catholicism and of course communism. And I am encouraging you to, to check this book because I think that it explains a lot. Well, Poland disappeared from the map yeah. for a, over, a, over a full century, and Carol Wojtyla said that what kept Poland alive, in a sense, was culture and this your area, the stage, and poetry and writing and literature. And also he shows uh, his love to his uh, country, and, uh, and I think that uh, Poland actually traveled and was everywhere with him. And he was mentioning about Poland, about the communism, and not only communism, but it was a great reflection and to bring Poland to each and every single country and conversation and people uh, he used to meet and talk and... After right. this, and I just want to make, point out that, that everybody's right is that Poland had a special place in Reagan's heart. There's no doubt about it. He went to Philadelphia uh, and, and gave a, a, a Polish greeting, which I won't even tr attempt to. Uh, but then he mentioned, you know, the, at the time the uh, the Eagles quarterback was Greg uh, was uh, Ron Jaworski, and then the third baseman slugger uh, was uh, Greg Luzinski for uh, the uh, Philadelphia Phillies, and the Polish audience just went wild. On his last trip to Europe, he made a special side trip to Warsaw to meet with <coughs> Lekwanza, and there, a hundred thousand shipyard workers serenaded Reagan with May You Live, the song May You Live, A Thousand Years, I think A Thousand Years or A Hundred Years. Still not. And that was such a, a, a special moment for Reagan. We're, we're painting a picture as we go along of a very strong, effective, and generally harmonious relationship between these two men and the things in which they believed. They weren't the identical, but there was a large overlap. But there must have been matters in which they deeply disagreed. What are the areas in which Reagan and the Pope were at variance? Um, I don't, there may not be many, and they may not be uh, crucially important, but there must have been some. Would, um, perhaps I can begin with Craig and come down the line. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd be hard-pressed to say. I, I don't know fully as much as uh, uh, Paul does uh, his uh, views of the uh, of, of supply-side economics. Mm -hmm. Uh, I suspect that that may have been a point of, dis of disagreement, more of a social obligation on the part of uh, government to the, to the common good than, than Reagan, not that he wasn't committed to uh, helping people, but he believed ultimately that people should help themselves. Uh, so I'm probably a little bit, uh, I'm flying a little bit blind here on that question. <laughs> um, Peter? I just don't know of disagreements between the president and the pope. I know that the American bishops were a problem. A problem. <laughs> yeah. and, but they actually, actually very, Goodness, very, very, that's changed. One, um, Cardinal Hickey, Cardinal Hickey, who was the Archbishop of Washington at the time, some nuns were killed in Nicaragua, if I recall, some nuns that he had sent. And he was called to testify, and he made statements against the administration. And uh, just a matter of weeks later, I got a call from his then secretary, who's now Archbishop Laurie, the Archbishop of Baltimore. We had known each other. And it turned out that Cardinal Hickey was appalled by the way that his statements had played out in the press. And he felt that he had been used by the left. And 
asked if it, it, the point is that it ended up with Cardinal Hickey having lunch with Vice President George H.W. Bush to actually sort out and think through what was really happening in Central America. So there's that kind of thing was taking place, but there's no doubt. I just am not aware of conflict between the Pope and the President, but the American bishops, it just never stopped. It certainly was. Paul? Well, I would add here, too, I really did not see many areas of disagreement. I thought I would find more. Um, but a couple of areas of agreement that we haven't talked about. Uh, one, Reagan and John Paul II both thought about subsidiarity, the principle of subsidiarity. And that word is even, I think, in the Notre Dame speech. I don't know if he actually said it, but it's in, in one of the handwritten transcripts of, of the speech. Uh, the idea that, that local control is best. You, you go to the local source to try to deal with issues of poverty, um, w whether through the town, the state, the county, all before you go to Washington, all federal. before you go to the federal. And another was on uh, what they both referred to constantly as the sanctity and dignity of human life. They, they use those words all the time. And Reagan very often quoted John Paul II on that. And finally, if you get a chance, uh, watch on YouTube the video of the two, the two of them speaking together in September 1987 in Miami when John Paul II gets off the plane. And they're both standing there quoting the American founders. Um, Reagan quotes Jacques Maritain, mm. uses a line about the founding fathers weren't metaphysicians, and, and John Paul II's admiration of America. So they, they really both had this, this mutual admiration of the, of the founding fathers. Thank you. Monica, you have 10 seconds. <laughs> uh, thank you. You're so generous. <laughs> I also can't remember about any disagreements between, uh, between both of them. I think it was a great, uh, they created great alliance, great uh, collaboration, partnership that really changed the world. Well, thank you very much. And by the way, a terrific partnership between these four people. I want to thank them very much indeed. Thank you.